talk about a tool, Andrew Davison from uh, CRRS in France. Okay, hi, thanks. Um, so to give you some, some background, um, so I started out, uh, so I'm not a mathematician. Um, I started out as a physicist and I'm now a, a computational neuroscientist, uh, if you like. Uh, and I do modeling and simulation of networks of neurons in the, in the early, in early sensory systems, mainly the visual system um, and the olfactory system. Um, and it's interesting that John's here. So a lot of my backgrounds use uh, images I've taken from, um, which are CC licensed images. Um, however, most, a lot of these are share alike uh, licensed. So I don't know if that means that this presentation can therefore be shared without a share alike license. So if you share the total presentation, it doesn't have to have, have the underlying license. If you really share the source files, they can share that. Okay, that sounds okay. So I can I can change this to a, sure to a pure attribution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, so before, before I start talking about Samata, the specific tool, um, I'll give some kind of context and how I got into this. Um, so of course we're talking about reproducibility, but that's a somewhat overloaded term, and uh, strictly speaking. Um, is this, uh, how do you, there. Is this, oh. Red so, 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 so to some people, many people I've talked to, this is the only real type of reproducibility. So they, they read your paper, and then they go away, completely independently reproduce your work. And they say, well, this, if you, know, if you, if you have the original code, yeah, you're, you're, make, you're making the same mistakes as the original author, the same bugs. So that's, that's not reproducibility, that's just mere replicability. In fact, it's, it's really a spectrum, so you can go, from, you know, this is kind of the easier end, um, and this gets gradually harder and harder. But in fact, I, mean, I argue that in fact the, this, in terms of uh, the progress of science, and especially enabling reuse, this is actually the most most perhaps the interesting end. And so what I'm going to talk about today is really this, this part um, about you know, reproducing the original results using the same tools, um, which should be easy, but it isn't always. So maybe I'm talking about replicability, but I mean, there, uh, it's overlapping. <clears throat> so I don't know how many of you will recognize these kind of uh, statements. So I, th I think you know, the, the, the get, this, this gets a laugh, which I guess means that this, it's, not, it's not just me who encounters these things, but these are, these are, these are widely uh, encountered uh, problems. And, and so the question becomes, given that you know, computers are deterministic, um, uh, and it should be, therefore, I mean, compared to kind of you know, wet sciences, biology and chemistry, where you have all this intrinsic um, biological variability, for example, um, why isn't it easy to reproduce a computational experiment uh, Exactly. So I think there are um, a number of reasons. First is that um, complexity. So A, the systems we're modeling are often uh, complex, or the data we're, now, we're analyzing are, are complex. Um, and so we end up, and, and certainly the, soft, the, the software we develop to do all this stuff ends up being complex. Um, so you have a dependence on, you know, one small thing changes, you have a big qualitative change to your results. Um, the second problem is, is entropy. So over time, your know, software changes, operating systems change, libraries change. And so if you try now to go and rerun uh, an analysis or a simulation you did five years ago, odds are you'd have to do quite a lot of updating to get it to run again. And secondly, not computer memory limitations, but, but human memory limitations. So we kind of forget what we did yesterday, and we certainly forget what we did six months ago and stuff which we just, it, it's implicit in our head at the moment, we, we don't even think of writing it down because we think we'll never, never forget it. Six months time or five years time, you forget that important detail which was just in, in your head at the time. Okay, so what can we do about uh, this problem? So I think for the complexity issue, um, so computer scientists and software engineers have developed a lot of, have dealt with complexity uh, and, and, and complication for a lot of years and developed a lot of 
useful tools um, in, in software development for, for achieving this. Scientists tend to just you know, pick up coding and programming as they go along and often don't pick up the, the useful techniques and tools um, which, which, which would really help them reduce the complexity of their code. As far as the kind of decay over time, I think this can be mitigated by planning from the start to reproduce your results. Um, and so don't just run on, on your desktop, your laptop. Run from the beginning on different machines, different environments. Check that your, 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 your colleague can, can reproduce the same results early on in the project. Um, yesterday, uh, Jared gave us a nice uh, introduction to, to, to testing. Um, and I think we should do this as part of any um, scientific computation. Um, and keep a track of exactly which versions of libraries and so on you used. And finally, to cope with memory limitations, just you know, try to record everything, write everything down, even trivial small details. And so Sumatra, the tool I'm going to talk about, really addresses this, this thing here. So these things are important. There are other, uh, other ways to tackle these. I'm going to talk about this one. And in fact, this is nothing new. I mean, scientists have been doing this for years. In your paper lab notebook, you, you write down every single detail. The contrast is not very good here, but... Uh, can we have the lights down, you think? Or? Can you see that? Yeah, that's a bit better. Um, yeah, so scientists have been doing this for years. So I guess what I'm arguing for... Yeah, so, and so, so what do we need to record to, to reproduce our simulations and our analyses? Um, the code, uh, how we run it, so what was the parameter files, the input data, <coughs> what options did we use, um, what was the platform, um, and then why did we do this? You, you often you, you, you come back and you find a, a really interesting result, but you can't remember why you did it at the time, and what was the outcome, what was the output data, uh, what, what figures did I produce, plus what was the kind of qualitatively, what was the general thing I learned from this particular analysis or this particular um, simulation. So, how do we record the code that was run? Well, we can store a copy of the executable, or we can just store the source code, and the source code of the libraries, and the compiler, and any options that we use for the compilation, the, the, the make file, and so on. If we're using an interpreted language, we can just record the version of the interpreter. Um, we might need to know what options it was used when it was compiled the interpreter. We certainly need to copy the simulation script, and anything that would be imported or included into our simulation script or our analysis script. Or if we're using version control, which we should be, we can just copy, store the URL and the version number. We don't have to store all the code. So if the platform information needs to record the processor architecture, um, the operating system, how many processors we used, etc., etc. The problem is that all this stuff is tedious to write down. Where it's tedious, it becomes error prone. And so this is a cartoon from uh, PhD Comics, which I guess many of you know. Um, but this, this, is, this is kind of the old school way of doing things, if you like. <laughs> <coughs> so so there's, there's, you actually look at this thing for, 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 for minutes and keep on finding new things in it, but um, you get the idea. So, um, so since you know, we're using computers and computers are good at automating things, let's avoid this uh, problem by automating it. So we're really talking about an automated uh, lab notebook, which is going to capture all this metadata about our, uh, ex our, our computational experiment. And the problem here is that there's a huge variety of uh, different researchers, and they all have different workflows. Um, some people use the command line, some people use GUIs, some people uh, run batch jobs on a big supercomputer somewhere. And projects can be just one PhD student working on, on his own project, or it can be collaborative with a, you know, a multi-center multi uh, uh, project. Or you might have any combination of these things at different parts of the project and at different phases of the project. And so what we need to have, um, we need to obviously automate as much as possible. Where you can't automate it, you have to get the information from the user in an easy way. Um, Given that version control systems solve half the problem for us already, we should make sure we, 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 we use them. We need to support um, all these different ways of running simulations and analyses. We need to keep a track of you know, what data was produced 
um, what, what data went into this analysis or simulation and what data comes out. Um, ideally, they should be not linked to any one particular language or community or tool. This should be a general purpose thing for, for all computational science. Um, and because of the kind of solo versus collaborative um, issue, we need to make sure we support um, both you know, one person working on their own machine and people working um, geographically spread out. And this is the most important one, uh, is if it's not very easy to use, um, only people who are very conscientious, so maybe people in this room, but not most of our colleagues, for example, will use it. Uh, and even the conscientious will not use it when they have deadlines. Um, so this is the most important requirement. So to try and address these, 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 these problems, um, I've developed this tool called Sumatra, which is implemented as a Python package, um, which enables systematic capture of the entire environment <coughs> of your numerical simulation analysis, so that in six months or five years' time, or you, you can reproduce it, or somebody you know, in a different lab elsewhere um, can reproduce it. And if they can't reproduce it, at least they can figure out where their environment differs from yours to, to kind of track down the problem as to, to where it's different. Um, so Sumatra, if you, if you use Python, you can just plug it, this, this, this package directly into your own code. If you don't use Python, uh, then we can yeah, develop tools which do use Python, uh, which can work with any, uh, any other tool. So currently, in terms of interfaces, we have a command line interface uh, called SMT and a web interface. Uh, it's also intended to be integrated into existing GUI-based tools uh, or, or any other you know, command line tools. So if you have a tool which you used for running simulations or running analyses, um, and if this tool uses um, Python or Java or I guess even .NET, given that Python has many different uh, runtimes now, you could integrate this in, into your tools. Uh, I have a colleague who, who develops a, a Java-based um, GUI for doing neural simulations and he uses Jython to, to, to run Sumatra within his, his tool. Um, or we could develop new tools from, from, from scratch. Okay, so Sumatra um, is available from, from this, uh, this URL. This will be again, I'll show this again at the end. Um, it's available under the, uh, the CSAIL license, which is a kind of French equivalent of the GPL. Um, I'm very open to the idea of relicensing it under BSD uh, type, type things, but for the moment I just picked, went, went with the, what was the least controversial in my local environment. But, uh, okay, so in case, just a quick aside, if you're wondering where the word name Sumatra comes from. So it started out as being a back formation for simulation management tool. Um, I then realized that actually this was useful not just for simulations, but also for any kind of computational experiment, and so the name doesn't quite fit uh, anymore. Uh, in any case, it's nothing to do with Java. So. So if you want to use Sumatra, you need to have the Python bindings for your preferred version control system, whether it's currently support SVN, Mercurial, Git, and Bazaar. If you want to use the web interface, you need to use the, the, the Django um, uh, web toolkit for Python. If you're running distributed computations on a cluster, you need MPI for Pi, uh, and you also need this uh, HTTP library. These, these are all very easy to uh, install and get installed automatically for you. Installation is like this, pretty easy. Uh, it's also, um, it's available in Arch Linux, it's been packaged for Arch Linux and it's hopefully gonna make its way into Debian at some point, but uh, for the time being, this is probably the easiest way to install this. It runs on Linux, uh, Mac, uh, and I haven't tested it on, on Windows. It ought to run because it's, it's, uh, it's Python, it's cross-platform, but uh, it hasn't been tested yet. So I'm going to talk now about the, uh, the SMT uh, interface. Um, so this, is, this behaves like many other kind of you know, command line tools. It has a main command and many options. So assuming that you already have in this uh, directory a project, some, some code, uh, and, it's under, and it's under version control, then this just creates uh, your, your, your new Sumatra project. Uh, you can also, if you don't have your project already checked out, you can add here a, an option with the, the URL of your repository and it will go and do a clone or a checkout and, and, and check out the code for you. But the essential thing is that your code is under version control. So then suppose that this is how you normally run your, your, your simulation on the command line. Um, 
some executable, some main file, some parameter file, maybe some data files, maybe some options or flags, or whatever. It doesn't have to be Python, it could be, it could be anything. Um, then you quickly you know, configure some defaults, because these things tend not to change. If you're, if you're running a lot of analysis simulations, this almost certainly doesn't change very often. This changes less often. This changes all the time. Um, and so you can set some defaults, and then you just have to do um, SMT run, and then the thing which changes most often, so your parameter file, your data file, um, flags, uh, and so on. And so going back to the idea that it should be uh, really easy to use, you've actually even re reduced the amount of typing people have to do. Um, you can also specify these things on a kind of run-by-run -run basis if you want. Um, so if you do need to change them from time to time, you don't have to change the defaults, you can just specify the different cases. So when you do this, what happens? So, so normally you just, you know, all, all that happens is, is you did do this part. Uh, using SMT, first of all, you create a record. You check using the version control system, has your code changed? If it has, then you can set the policy. You can be really strict and say, okay, if my code's changed, it means I'm not reliably, I'm not certain that the code I run is the code corresponds to the right version. And so you just stop and say, please check in your changes, please commit your changes, and try again. Or you can be a bit, that, this gets, gets a bit painful sometimes if you're just making small changes, not really worth checking in, uh, committing these big changes. So you can just tell it, okay, well, just store this diff, which should be small, and keep on going. It then goes through and it analyzes your, your script, um, your, your source code, and it finds all the dependencies, everything you've imported, included, whatever language you're using, whatever the terminology is, everything which your code needs um, to run, and what, what are the versions of those dependencies. It finds out the information about the platform you're running this thing on, uh, the processor architecture, this kind of stuff. Then it does the run, the how long it takes, then it detects what new data has been created by your analysis, by your uh, simulation. Um, you can add tags to it at the end, then it saves the record. And so now we've run a couple of simulations. We can list what we've run, again, on the command line, so the short form or the long form. So we can see you know, an auto-generated label, uh, the timestamp, these things you can, you can add in later or, or, or at the time, how long it took. Identification of your code, um, of the executable, the parameters, data, input and output, how you ran it, whether it was in a cluster or just your local machine, any tags, dependencies, and so on. Yeah, as I said, by default it will generate an auto, auto generate uh, a label for you, but you can add your own label, for example. Uh, to put this in context, um, uh, Python is named after Monty Python, uh, and so this is, a, this is a quote from the life of Brian. Um, yeah, so the take-home message is you can specify a label and you can specify on the command line, well, why did I run this simulation? What was I expecting to get before I started? And at the end, you can say what was the actual outcome um, of your experiment. Um, yeah, so, so all the commands, by the, if, if you don't provide a label, <coughs> they, they operate on the most recent uh, thing you did, or you can specify an explicit uh, label for an earlier experiment. Um, so you can kind of go back and comment and add comments and tags um, to earlier experiments. Yeah, like this. <clears throat> Another nice thing you can do, um, provided your parameter file, um, uh, so you don't have to have a parameter file. You, you can't just keep all your, put your, all your parameters into your source code. That's fine. I find it nicer to separate out your parameters in a purely declarative way um, from, your, from, from your code. Um, and provided your parameter file uh, is in a format which Sumatra understands, which this is a fairly wide range of common formats, then very often you, know, you, you have this kind of standard default set and you just want to change one or two parameters at a time. So this lets you just on the command line um, uh, change just those few parameters you want. Rather than having to edit this, edit this entire file to rerun, you can just, uh, just modify things on the command line. Um, and the kind of payoff is that when you run an experiment, experiment, you can then later on you can go uh, SMT repeat, give the label of your experiment, and it will go and uh, rerun the, the same experiment, um, but, but in the current environment. It doesn't try to recreate the old environment, 
uh, in terms of the, the, the processor and so on, but it does try to it does check out the, the, the version of the code you had at that at that time, um, and it will check uh, if the results um, are the same. And hopefully you get this message, uh, and if you don't, then you get a detailed breakdown of exactly where what's different between um, not just in the output data but in the environments between the code you ran then and you ran now. So you, you run the same experiment, you get a different result. You can say, oh, it's because I updated this library, um, and and this somehow changed changed things. So the command line's great for running things, but for actually looking at results. Um, oh, hang on, I've got a few more things to say. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, information about, 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 about the project. So, you, so for a project, you can set lots of the default stuff, which stops, stops you having to type it uh, again. Um, the whole bunch of, bunch of commands, uh, it's all self, kind of self-documenting. Um, yeah, so the command line's great for running simulations, but this kind of SMT list, uh, you know, the, the, kind of the console's not a great environment for kind of browsing through results you already have. So there's a, a simple uh, web interface which runs a local web server on whichever port you want and lets you browse through your results later on. So it kind of looks something like this and uh, um, if there are any, uh, any expert web designers who have time on their hands, I'm happy and open to, to collaboration and to improve this, add some nice JavaScript stuff. But basically it lets you go through and it gives you some basic information about all your experiments uh, together, or you can click on a particular tag and see just experiments with, with that particular tag, or you can click on the, the kind of type the, the label and go down, drill down into the detail of the experiment. So again, here we see all the metadata which we've captured um, about the experiment, the output data files, all the dependencies, and here. So this is a, uh, a Python thing, and so it uses a number of different heuristics to try and figure out what, <coughs> what's the version of each library. Uh, that you use, and sometimes it can't do this, sometimes it doesn't work, um, and oft, oft, often it can. And so this is a good point. So here, you know, we, we, we haven't managed, we haven't succeeded in capturing everything 100%, but even knowing 90% of the context of your experiment is better than knowing none of it. Um, pardon? The binaries or the libraries, uh, or just the version numbers? At the moment, just the version numbers. I mean, this, this would certainly be, 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 be an option, but for the moment, it's just the version numbers. Um, so for, for, for the data files, um, we do keep it, I, we, we take a hash of, of, of the file contents. So if you, have a, if you repeat this same experiment and overwrite your original file, for example, this will know that this was not the file you originally created. Um, so it uses, and it uses this hash to speed up the comparisons later on. And you can even drill down to individual data files and browse them. And you know, if, if obviously, if these are images, it will show the image. And it has some kind of intelligence. So if, if it's a, a CSV, CSV file, for example, it will um, display it as an HTML table. There's various little conveniences. <clears throat> so, so SMT is, is, is great uh, if you, because uh, it works with any, in theory, any um, kind of command line driven um, tool. If you're using Python, you get to customize things a bit more. So you can use some with your own scripts. So here, this is a very simple example. This is a file which basically just um, generates some random numbers and writes them to, writes them to file. Um, and so if you want to um, add some more to support to this, so instead of having to run this with the SMT, you just run Python like, 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 like normal. Then you need to do the following. You need to uh, import some stuff from, from the Sumatra, so load project and build parameters. Here we take advantage of the ability to actually customize our, our labels so we can, you know, we, we can give our output file a, a label which is specific to the uh, timestamp effectively generated by Sumatra for us. Um, we can use Sumatra support for understanding parameter files um, to, uh, to read in the parameter file, which means that later on we can hopefully we can do searches, you know, give me just the results which use a certain set of parameters or certain you know, values between this and this, and so on. We uh, load our project, we create a new record, um, then we do our original run, then we record all the stuff um, which was you know, done by this, and we save it. So I mean, you know, the lines in gray are the, orig the original code, and the black is what you add for Sumatra, and for a simple file, like this, this is you know, the smart with a lot of code. But generally, your, your, your real scripts are hundreds or thousands of lines long. So the Sumatra is really a very small uh, amount of code to add. 
And in fact, for simple use cases, it's even easier. You can just use a nice Python decorator feature. You can import this capture decorator. You wrap your, your main function with the capture decorator, and then so you, all you have to add these extra lines, and you get all this, uh, all this stuff that you get also with, with SMT. So I said it supports various parameter file formats. Currently, uh, just these are all simple text formats, so a very simple uh, you know, key value, pair, all the kind of typical config, any file format, or JSON. <coughs> um, if you have a parameter file format which, which doesn't match this, using XML or something, uh, it's very straightforward to write a new uh, subclass which can, which can handle your particular parameter file. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, understand your parameter file, it'll still work. It just means that you can't use this nice techniques like adding, like changing parameters on the command line or um, searching by parameters later on. So the tools for finding dependencies, uh, this has to be done on a per language basis. So currently we only support Python, then a couple of neuroscience um, simulation languages. Um, I plan to add in the near future support for MATLAB, Octave and R. Um, and, uh, but I don't use these on a day-to-day -day basis. So anyone who does use these on a day-to-day -day basis and would like to, uh, to work with me on adding support for, uh, for uh, dependency finding for, for these tools, I'd be very happy to, to talk to you. Uh, and then once it's found the dependencies, it uses various heuristics for v finding the versions. Some are language specific, so in Python it's very common to have, a, have this double underscore version, double underscore variable, or a module called version, or a function called get version, so it tries all these things. Um, there are others which could be used. Um, and then some of these methods are generic. So if the dependency code is under version control as well, that's very straightforward. Um, I plan to add the ability. So if, if your dependencies are managed by uh, a Linux package manager, for example, it can hopefully query the package manager to find out the version. So it links to input and output data, and the intention is that this should be very generic. So whether your input data comes from a, the file system locally, or from a database, <coughs> or from somewhere on the web, um, the idea is to have a kind of generic interface to all this. Currently, it just supports um, the file system data. We store the uh, SHA1 digest of the data to make sure that it really hasn't changed. Um, yeah, and I said this already. And so I talked about the need to support both, you know, one student working on their local desktop machine and large collaborative projects. And so there are multiple ways where, for Samato to store all this information in a database, um, both, both, both locally, so that this, this is a simple database based on the Python shelf module, which is simple and slow. It has the advantage it has no uh, dependencies. It comes with the Python standard library shelf. Um, this is the default using the Django Python web framework um, and SQLite um, as a backend. It would be straightforward to swap this out with MySQL or PostgreSQL or something like this. Um, and then because normally, quite, quite often because of, because of firewalls and such like, you can't access databases you know, over the web. Um, and so we have this uh, HTTP based um, API which lets you have your, your records on a, on a remote machine you can get them from there. So yeah, so, so more on, on that last, last one. So, um, so this is distributed as a, as a separate project, to Marta's server, which you can get from, from here, from Bitbucket. So basically it's a very simple um, JSON over HTTP API. Um, so in fact, you, know, you don't have to use um, Sumatra for this. You could implement your own independent version. In fact, someone has, has, has done this based on MongoDB. Um, and this would be an interesting way Possibly if you know, other people have tools which do similar things, we could think about having a kind of interchange format uh, which lets these tools uh, interoperate based on, based on this kind of JSON representation. Yeah, so currently, as I said, because I think version control solves half of the problem of keeping track of what you did, um, Sumatra requires that your code is under version control. Currently, we support subversion, Git, Mercurial, and Bazaar. Uh, if someone uses something else and really wants to use it, then talk to me. It's not too hard to... Uh, we only support a small kind of subset of the... Uh, you know, the kind of common subset of the abilities of all these tools, so it's fairly straightforward to implement. Um, and so some people say, well, you know, I don't want to use version control. Couldn't you just store a copy of the code? 
Uh, I don't know, maybe I should. I mean, in terms of making it easy to use and getting the widest possible number of use, use, users. Um, so I'm happy to, in the questions, to, to talk about this. Would people like me just to forget about version control, just store a copy of the code? The alternative is that we just secretly, if people are using version control, we just secretly put it all into a Git or a subversion or, or a Mercurial repository, hide it. They don't need to know about it, but we just use it under the skin. This feels a bit sneaky to me, but you know, it's probably OK. Yeah, people ask about not running to support <coughs> um, I, I've, I've only so, so I mean of I have in the region of you know, 10 to 10 to 20 30 users and only one has asked, asked me about this so far and, and, people, and people I've talked to it presenting this at conferences and stuff um, most people are happy using version control but the occasional people don't like it or for whatever reason or they they're, not, they're scared by it um, and so they, they don't want to, to use it, yeah. So I'm not sure why you say that would be sneaky. I mean, it seems like if you want to keep track of what version they use, then that would just, it'd just be a tool you could use to do it, like using a database program to keep track of other things. So. I think that's right, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's just, my initial reaction was I, I don't want to mess with people's, you know, I, I want to mess with people's code as little as possible. Um, and, and so I don't want to risk a, a, bug, a bug in Sumatra messing up their code somehow. So, so I've kind of avoided it. Um, I guess once, once Sumatra is, 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 is more mature and stable, it would probably you know, a, safer, a safer option. But for the moment, um, I try very hard to minimize how much I mess with people's code, effectively. So the, I need the idea, yeah. Um, I'll come back to that. So um, I have various plans, and I'm happy to hear of any other ideas people would like to do. So at the moment, we don't, so, so your executable like, like Python in this case, or if you, if you come, currently this is optimized for people doing, using interpreted languages. If you write your own um, uh, C++ or Fortran code and compile it yourself, we have rudimentary support, but it's not well supported. Um, so where it's possible, it would be good to, to determine the compilation options. So Python, for example, knows what options it was compiled with. Um, similarly, not just for but any, any kind of shared libraries and so on more generally. Um, I think this is a very hard problem uh, in the general case. Uh, if anyone has a good way to do it, I'm happy to hear about it. Um, I plan to implement other data stores. So, so rather than just assuming that data is on your local file system, it could be uh, elsewhere on the, on, on, the, on the web. It could be inside some kind of you know, container, like HTF5. It could be in a database. Uh, I think Drop, Dropbox and similar tools are, are a very nice idea for, for being able to share your data um, more widely. Uh, yeah, so add dependency finders for MATLAB, Octave, R, and compiled languages. Um, add the ability to run things elsewhere. So, so currently it supports running things using, using MPI. Um, but if you just want to launch a serial process but on a different machine, so logging in using SSH, starting it there and coming back, uh, so I'll add support for that. Um, similarly, for running, like, you know, firing off a whole bunch of, of, t of things at once with different, slightly different parameters or slightly different data files, or for a very simple workflow, so if you just have a, a, you know, a common sequence where you, 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 know, you run a, an analysis script, then a visualization script, then you, you, know, you run LaTeX to compile your manuscript, you could batch this up as a, work, as a workflow, a simple workflow, and run the whole thing with a single command. And it might be nice to launch computations from the web interface uh, as well. So to sum up, um, so Sumatra is uh, a toolbox for capturing all the information about your experiment that you need to be able to reproduce it later, or at least figure out later why you can't reproduce it. Um, so for any language, it will capture a large amount of basic metadata. Um, if you want to capture dependencies, you have to have a, a plugin specific to your language. <clears throat> and so this can be used inside, other, inside many different interfaces. You can use it in your, in, in your, in your own uh, tools if they're, if they're based on Python. Or you can use the existing interfaces like SMT, which has a nice advantage is that it requires no changes to your code, and it requires very minimal changes to your workflow. And so again, this is the main guiding principle um, behind this. So that's it. Thank you very much. So one of the things I think about when I'm doing a lot of this like empirical experimental work is 
about this branch, right? Because you know, I, I don't care. I don't think anyone just kind of goes and walks step and marches through a process and you know everything is perfect. You know, oftentimes what I do is I try one thing to tune one another thing and I have to go back yeah. and I want to undo what I did and then I go to another branch and I explore this and I said, oh no, I don't like that. I go back. Yeah. And I think you know, version control to already have branching built in. I think it'd be really cool um, to think about how you can provide a higher level layer of support for branching and Sumatra, both in terms of the command line interface and also in the, the web visual, like visualizing the different branches. Um, have you thought anything about branching as kind of in Sumatra? Well, well yes. Yeah, so, so, so Sumatra is kind of agnostic to branching. So I mean, I mean you, you, you're still going to want to use your version control tool um, for everything you use it for. For now, um, so Sumatra doesn't support at the moment um, <coughs> Git and Mercurial uh, branches. I've had a feature request for this already, and so this this will be added pretty soon. Um, in, ter in terms of a more complex support for branching, yeah, um, I, I think I'd, I'd need to, to, to yeah to, to discuss the use case more in detail. I'm also very happy for people to go you know go go ahead and and you know make their own interfaces based on this and and, and play with it, add th add things. Um, but I'm certainly happy to talk with you about it uh, in more detail about, about that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, about protecting the whole package against changes in the Python interpreter itself and the dependencies, especially not on a one year time scale, on a 10, 20 year time scale? So you, you, well, are you talking about using Python as you Python what using to run your run your well, experiments, or Python as in powering Sumatra? You're using you yourself are using some tools to provide a Sumatra environment. Yeah. And in order to reproduce my research using that environment, I would have to be able to reproduce Sumatra itself. So there's a bit of a bootstrap question, which is nice to address, especially if you want this to do not for reproducibility on somebody else's computer in the next month or so, but archiving over a 10-year time span. Yeah, so, so, so essentially, like, I feel two aspects to that question. So, so, so firstly, all you're capturing here really is, is some metadata. So it's a, it's a fairly, so it's a not too extensive list of kind of, you know, key value pairs. Uh, and, and there's an SMT export command, which just dumps the whole thing out uh, in JSON format, just in, te in text, easy to pass text format. So it's very easy to t kind of get this stuff out of uh, Sumatra and into some different different tool. Um, I think in, in, in terms of perhaps the most problematic aspect is, is, is the links to the, um, to, 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 the, to the data, the output data. And so if, you ha if, if your output data is going to some kind of like, you know, long-term uh, archive, then we might want to think about some, so I, I'm not quite sure, um, there might be something to think about there, but essentially we, we, we just identify the the kind of output, uh, you know, where your output data goes to, and then we identify the, the path within this, you know, whether it's a, a file system path or a database uh, query which retrieves this particular data, and then we have the, 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 the hash so that we know that this is actually the, really is the real data that you produced at the, at the time. Um, you can also move, move data. So for example, in the file system, we, we, we store kind of a, the kind of root directory as a, as a separate parameter. So if you want, if you want to move all your data, uh, you know, maintain your kind of tree, but just move it somewhere else. You can just change the kind of the root path and move it around. Uh, but, but I think your, your main point with regard to you know, Python powering Sumatra is that we can dump this whole thing out in text format and, some, and share it with somebody else that way. Yeah. So my question is about Sumatra's ability to detect consistency between experiments. So I know you said at the beginning that your presentation is more about replicability. Yeah. But um, so say you're running a heuristic or a simulation. Oftentimes, when you rerun the exact same experiment with the exact same parameters, you might have numbers which are different, but the results between both experiments are very consistent. So a diff, you know, would might say, hey, these are completely different, but in fact, the experiments could be, you know give you basically the same result, though in different numbers. So does Sumatra have any kind of features to detect this kind of stuff? At the moment, no. I mean, this, this, is, this, is a very, this is a very hard problem. So this, and this is a problem which we, I encounter a lot in doing neural network simulations. 
So often these kind of networks of cortical neurons um, are operating in a regime which is, which is very high dimensional, very close to chaos. And so you find that very small numerical differences, if you use a slightly different integration method, for example, then you might get the same behavior for the first you know, 200 milliseconds of simulated time, but then things diverge and very quickly. Um, the, the, you know, the kind of detailed uh, data looks very different, but often the statistics of the network don't change. The, the, the stats are the same, but it's just the details which change. And so there are many, you know, this, this is, it's, it's a very active research area in its own right. How do you detect you know, whether a, a quantitative difference is significant qualitatively? Um, and so I guess as tools come out for this, Sumatra can uh, incorporate them, but for the moment it just uses a very simple naive diff approach. Okay, let's thank you.